Welcome to A Common Ground, where we study difficult biblical subjects. Today we have a very basic subject that has become difficult in the religious world because it has been abused. It is the subject of the Lord's Supper. Our goal for this broadcast is to unite the religious world again. So we hope that you brought your Bibles and that you'll study with us as we talk about the Lord's Supper today. Stay tuned as we talk about it in just a moment. On July the 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong said, A small step for man and a giant leap for mankind. What people don't realize on that occasion is it was the first day of the week, and Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins all partook of the Lord's Supper in space on the first day of the week. You know, even these men knew that the Lord's Supper was important, and they also had in mind when it was to be partaken. So today, we're going to talk about the subject of what surrounds the Lord's Supper. We're going to talk about the purpose of it, the, the meanings of the emblems, and things like that. Today, we have with us Michael Clark. And uh, Michael, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you preach, and where you're from. I'm from South Haven, Mississippi. I preach now in the Somerville, Tennessee area, the Somerville Church of Christ. And I've been there going on three years this September. All right. We always appreciate your good work. You do a good job on the show every time you've been on. And today, when you think about the focus of the Lord's Supper, what are some things that come to your mind? You know, the Lord expected us to, once a week, remember His Son's death. And all of our lives are spent with people designing apps, designing technology to help us not forget certain things. Uh, years ago, you didn't have the ability to get on your phone and look at your calendar and see what events you had coming up. You had to actually keep a pocket calendar with you. But it was designed so that you could write down important things so that you wouldn't forget. Uh, today we've got things on just television alone, direct TV, uh, TiVo type programs that allow you to record a series of programming so that you don't forget when it comes on. And we do that because we know mankind is a forgetful being at times. And God is the supreme understander of that. He created man and He knows no over anyone else that our focus sometimes shifts from what it should be. And we forget things, life gets busy, and so He determined that we would need a reminder and the focus of the Lord's Supper is to take time to focus upon Jesus Christ and upon His death. And in fact, you're talking about remembering a sacrifice that only took about nine hours total for Christ to be crucified and to die. But we remember it once a week, every week, and we remember it as long as we're Christians. And even when I was a small boy and not a member of the Lord's Church yet, I knew when the Lord's Supper was starting that my focus was supposed to shift from the sermon, if it was on giving or anything, it's supposed to shift to Christ's death. And I often would try to open up the Bible and go to a place where it talks about His death and read it because I knew that was what my focus needed to be. Yeah, I love those illustrations you use, man. Those are really great. You know, we, we sometimes feel like we need to remember certain things in life, but, you know, oftentimes we may forget the most important things if we're not careful. And the Lord's Supper is designed specifically, like Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. A mm -hmm. uh, passage that comes to my mind, uh, I think of Luke chapter 22, verse 19. It says, He took bread and He gave thanks and break it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. So it seems like when the Lord's Supper is being instituted, He's specifically saying, I want you to remember that my blood is going to be shed for you. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts as far as the, the focus is concerned? I think about Paul, really. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And the majority of New Testament sermons, for instance, in the Ethiopian eunuch, you have, he began in Isaiah 53 and preached unto him Jesus. And the focus of the New Testament preaching was primarily on Jesus Christ. And even if you go to Galatians and other passages like that, where the focus had shifted from Christ to idolatry and the old law or whatever, the focus has always tried to bring back to Christ Jesus. And Paul's sitting here saying, Look, I, when I was with you, determined not to know anything except Christ and Him crucified. When I talked with you, when I preached to you, 
That is who I mentioned to you. And I think so many times, not just with the Lord's Supper, but with a lot of things in life, we forget about Christ's death. And there is such a way for us to get into this habit of remembering things, this, well, it's that time to do this. Let me pull my check out and put it in the offering plate. It's time to pray. Let me bow my head and you know, pretend that I'm following along with the person leading the prayer. We can get into these ruts, but if we really do remember Christ's body being bruised and, and broken open with the blood coming out and all of the things that happened on the cross for us, I don't think we can ever sit there and not be touched by what happened and not have a moment during the Lord's Supper where we're almost brought to sorrow during it. Now, it's a, it's a happy occasion that we're able to sit there and remember Christ's death because that gives us hope and we have this opportunity to commune with Christ, so to speak. But it should be something that brings us great sorrow because the what, the what of what we're remembering is a man who had done nothing wrong being brutally murdered because of us. And I, I really think sometimes we, we might forget about that part of it. And it's, well, we're doing this because we're commanded to do it. Yeah. That's our focus. Uh, you know, it is a commandment, but the focus really needs to be on, this is why I get to do it. I get to do it because he died for me to be able to be a Christian. Yeah. And only a Christian can partake of this supper. It's so important. You know, I, I like how you mentioned that because I, I sort of am thinking about the, the salvation factor of it. It's, it's very joyous, but then the serious factor of it too, you know, we're thinking like, okay, I need to be there for that. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if my aunt or uncle or somebody in, in the family were to die, you know, most likely we're going to be at the funeral service. Right. And that's sort of the idea of what's being uh, taught here about the Lord's Supper is it is a memorial funeral service for Jesus every week. And isn't it sad, you were talking about a relative dying, isn't it sad that there are people in this world that would travel hours and hundreds of thousands of miles even perhaps to be at their relative's funeral, but they can't drive 10 miles down the road to go to church every Sunday yeah. and remember the Lord. Yeah, that, that is a shame, you know. And The, the sad truth is when, when we are away from Christ, our priorities get sort of mixed up. You know, mm -hmm. I, I did not grow up you know, I knew about the church, but my parents were not faithful. So I, I can sort of think back in my mind when I was not coming to church, priorities get all mixed up. But when a man comes to Jesus and decides to lay down his life in service to his will, you don't have to beat him over the head with scripture right. to tell him to be at church, right. to be there for the Lord's Supper, because he already appreciates it. Can you think of some verses that come to mind when you think about this subject, the focus of the Lord's Supper? I think really, I, I like looking back to the idea that number one, we're talking about this being a memorial and the focus of a memorial is to look on someone else's life and what they've done and accomplished. Um, you know, every year at certain television broadcasting programs, they'll talk about who we've lost this year. And the entire portion of that broadcast is specifically d designed to talk about those people. It's no longer about those who are there for the award ceremony or those who are there for whatever. The focus has been shifted. And our worship, our worship is something that we give to God, but the Lord's Supper does seem to be a shift in what we're doing in worship. It's a shift from our worship to the Lord and our remembering to Christ's death. Sure. And I think it, it, we've got to go back to the institution of the Lord's Supper. And really, I like Luke 22, where it talks about beginning in about verse 15, where Jesus says, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And then if you look at verse 17, he says, take this and divide it among yourselves. And then in verse 19, he says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So there are a few things that I'd like to bring out as we want to talk about focus. Christ desired to have this Passover, verse 17. He divided it amongst all of them. There was not anyone in that assembly, including Jesus, who was, or Judas, I should say, including Judas, who was left out of that Lord's Supper. The Lord's betrayer was included in this Lord's Supper. And it was also a doing of the Lord's Supper. Verse 19, it says, every time that you do this, you do it in remembrance of me. So there's the three things. I then must desire to take the Lord's Supper every week. I should be excited to focus on the Lord's death. I should make sure that everyone in the congregation as a gospel preacher could be divided amongst the bread and the fruit of the vine and have that opportunity themselves. But then I also have to do it. 
And I have to make sure that each time I do it, my focus is in the right place because that's exactly what Jesus told me to do. When you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. I can't sit there and partake of the Lord's Supper. And, and typically speaking, the Lord's Supper is either before the sermon or after the sermon. Those are usually the two times I've seen it done. Well, if it's after the sermon, I've seen a couple of times where, uh-oh, the football game's coming on. And it's my team playing in the playoffs. And so I'm, I'm worried about the game because I want my team to win. And so as I, pay, as I partake of that fruit of the vine or I partake of that bread, my focus is not on Christ Jesus as much as it's, okay, I'm doing this, but I'm really thinking about the game. Or, where are we going to eat? Where are we going to lunch today? And I, I really believe that it may not even be a bad idea for some of our congregations to say, can we start our worship by partaking of the Lord's Supper? Sure. Because when you start off with the tone being, we're going to focus on Jesus' death, and that's how we're starting our worship, I really wonder if that wouldn't help some of our focus be more on Christ again. Because when we put it before the sermon, or we put it after the sermon, when I was a kid, this was my thought. My focus wasn't always in the right place. All right, it's before the sermon today. That means when the sermon's over, we'll be that much closer to getting out of worship. Mm -hmm. You know, an eight-year-old kid, he's, he's getting bored, he's tired, he's been in Bible class, he's been in the worship service. Sure. Now that it's after worship where I'm, where I'm actually attending now, sometimes it, it does come across my own mind hey, we're almost done with worship, and I've got to get ready for Bible class that's coming up in the next few minutes. I've got to get ready for the next service and all those kinds of things. That's a dangerous game to play because I am expected to give my all and all of my focus to Christ Jesus. And that's exactly what he wanted. There was a desiring to, to partake of the feast. There was a dividing amongst everyone. There was no one excluded. And then there was a doing of the feast. You have this mentality of every time you do this, this is how you're supposed to do it. Yeah. And I, I love those points that you have there. It really sort of drives it home. You know, we, we are supposed to be focusing on the death of Christ. You know, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, when Paul taught the Corinthians about the institution of the Lord's Supper, he told them what had been previously taught to him. Right. And he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26. In the previous verses, he mentioned twice to do this in remembrance of me, is what Christ said. So I, I really love and appreciate that. And I, I, I sort of want to make an illustration here and then move on. But I'm reminded of a woman named Sarah Winchester. She is the heir of the Winchester estate, mm -hmm. if you will. And anyway, she decided that she was going to build this house. And she had a vision that as long as she kept building the house, she would keep living. So the house ended up with who knows how many bedrooms. Uh, I think it says a 17 room mansion, or now has 150 rooms, hmm. 13 bathrooms, 2,000 doors, 47 fireplace and 10 fireplaces, and 10,000 windows. And during that time, it was worth $5 million. Wow. That's been in the early 1900s. So you can imagine today this memorial that stands for the Winchester family. And people would pay money to go see it. But how many people won't go partake of the most important memorial of all for free to remember the death of Christ? All right, so let's move on then. We talk about the focus, but then, you know, let's talk about the foundation of this thing. What do we use to partake of the Lord's Supper and why? Well, the, the ultimate foundation is like we've been talking about. Before we get to the emblems themselves, I want to make the point that we are the greatest benefit, benefiters of the most horrible suffering that's ever occurred in this world. I'm the benefiter of that. You're the benefiter of that. And that's Christ Jesus' death. And as I look at the, the foundation for the Lord's Supper, it wouldn't mean anything for these emblems to be you know, on our table on the Lord's Day if we weren't able to look back to a sacrifice like that. You know, things become symbolic for something only when that event occurs. Sure. And so that's what Jesus is meaning when he says, you can take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. He didn't mean it was broken right in that moment. He's saying, it's going to be broken for you. I'm going to die and this bread will represent my body that will be marred and brutally beaten and, and, and bleeding for you. And this, the fruit of the vine is my blood that will be poured out for you. 
And so that's the ultimate foundation, but he does use these emblems to help us look to that, and we have that ourselves. They say smells sometimes can bring back memories. You smell something, and maybe you smell a, a pie, and you think, oh, that reminded me of my grandmother. Or you smell a certain type of perfume, and you go, I remember my mother used to wear that perfume when I was growing up. Or you hear a song, and you go, man, that takes me back to high school. I remember being in high school and that song played on the radio. Sometimes those type of things bring about these types of memories that we have. And that's what Christ was hoping for the bread and the fruit of the vine to do. The foundation of our Lord's Supper are things that when I look at them, I can't help but to see emblems of the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. and, and I understand we see grape juice all the time in the store. And I don't look at grape juice and immediately go, oh, well, that's the fruit of the vine because it's a different setting. But if you were to put that circular tray, and I were to see those tiny cups around there, the only thing I could think of is the Lord's Supper. That's what God intended. That's what the foundation of something is supposed to be. It's just like if you were to see an NFL logo, you immediately think of football. And that makes sense because that's what that logo stands for. The foundation of the Lord's Supper is what you mentioned a moment ago in 1 Corinthians 11. The foundation was that Jesus is close to His death, and He has all of His disciples present, and he says, look, I've desired to have this feast with you, Luke 22, but here's what the feast is going to be. Let me lay the foundation for you. I, I preached yesterday on the foundation of the church and how that was Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus in, is actually laying a foundation for another part of the church here, which is the Lord's Supper. And that's an interesting parallel that it wasn't just him being the foundation for the church, but he also laid the foundation for the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to lay this out in front of you and you're not going to have any questions about how this is supposed to be done. Yeah. And I love that. No one in the New Testament church said, well, how is the Lord's Supper supposed to work? They all knew because of the example and the foundation that was laid, which was take this bread and eat and remember my body, which is broken for you. Take this cup and drink the fruit of the vine and remember my blood, which is shed for you. And we don't have necessarily time, I don't think, to get into all this, but I know some people will say, well, those emblems actually become the body, and they actually become the blood of Christ. I can personally vouch, and I'm sure you could too, that has never happened to me when yeah. I've partaken of the Lord's Supper. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think if it did, that would be a, a pretty big memory sure. in my mind. Sure. But the, this is a memorial. It, it's just a symbolic view of Christ's death. It's mm -hmm. not the actual blood or the actual body. It right. symbolizes it. You know, it's uh, interesting in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26, he said, As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. So he, he's very specific. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what if we gathered around a table and we had steak and potatoes and salad hmm. and we said, you know, we're going to remember the death of Christ and this is going to be the Lord's Supper. Well, in the New Testament, he, he specified, right? He said, you take the bread fruit of the vine, which represent the body and the blood of Christ. You know, would it be wrong for us to change that? Absolutely. Uh, it goes back to the argument with Noah. Noah, build you an ark of gopher wood. Well, what if oak had been better? What if cedar was going to be stronger in the flood? What if gopher wood was the worst wood possible to use if you wanted to go out onto the water? But Noah didn't say any of that. Noah didn't have that mentality. He said, if that's what God wants, that's what I'm going to do. When we were little, we used to play church at home, as I think a lot of kids do that grow up in church, especially those who have a preacher for a father. And we wanted to do the Lord's Supper, and all we had were Pop-Tarts and Coke. And so we grabbed the Pop-Tarts and the Coca-Cola, and we brought it out. And my dad immediately got this funny look on his face and said, okay, time out. I know that what you're doing is because we're playing church. We're not actually in church. But I want to make sure you understand that this isn't what we would do on Sunday. And he stopped and gave us that teachable moment. I've never forgotten it. Even though I knew when we grabbed the Pop-Tarts and the Coca-Cola that that's not what we would normally do, I also learned very quickly, I should never expect to see that on the Lord's table. I should never expect to see steak and potatoes because it's not what God has specified. That's right. Uh, let's sort of shift gears a little bit. When you think about what's to be used, you know, when are we supposed to do this? And, and, you know, does the Bible give a specific time when we are to remember the death of Christ, specifically as a church? 
Acts 20 and verse 7 tells us that it was the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. And so that gives me the very clear understanding that it's the first day of the week, and every week has a first day. And then you have also in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, where Paul says, I want you to take up a collection on the first day of the week. So he even establishes that the giving is done on the first day of the week because you're already assembled together to break bread. So go ahead and take up a collection so that there's no gatherings when I come. That's what I've got. And even Luke 24, 1 and 2 talks about the first day of the week mm -hmm. is when all of these things are to take place. And God's been very clear. And I, I think we've talked about this some before. Some people have collection but no communion, and some people have communion but no collection, which is more rare, I would say, but I think that the typical view is, well, it's Easter. I've got to go and take communion. Well, it's Christmas. I've got to go and take communion. But why not every other first day of the week? What, what has become so special about Easter and Christmas, which Christmas alone is not even a, a significant date? So what has become so special about those days that we'll forget the others? And I think it's amazing. Forget your wife's anniversary once and see how that goes. Yeah. Forget the anniversary of, of you know, anything that's super important and see how that goes. And we, we remember 9-11. And it's now been well over almost two decades now. We're getting close to two decades since 9-11 occurred. Sure. And yet if I say 9-11, the first thing that pops into someone's mind is the Twin Towers being taken down. We don't forget things like that. Well, if I'm not going to forget that, why can I forget Jesus' death? Why can I pick and choose when I want to take communion? I shouldn't be able to. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's a good point. You know, the collection, oftentimes they say, uh, or the Lord's Supper, they say, it will lose its significance <laughs> if we do it every week. But the money, for some reason, never loses its significance. You know, to me, that's sort of strange. Well, you know what it is, Josh? They're, they're putting a dollar amount to the Lord's Supper. Money doesn't lose value in their mind because every week you're getting a dollar, you're getting a, a check, and so they assign it that value of that's why we're going to make sure we do it every week. But we don't look at the Lord's Supper as being valuable. And that's really what it boils down to. The church understands, or even a denomination understands, if we stop giving we lose our money, we're not going to be able to function. Yeah. But they're forgetting that they're denying a commandment that the Lord has given to them. How is this different really from Nehemiah 8 with the Feast of the Booths, where they hadn't kept that feast since the days of Joshua, and they found out, wait a minute, we're supposed to be doing this. And just because it had fallen by the wayside, it didn't mean that they were exempt from doing it. That's what they discovered. And they reestablished that feast. I really think even the denominational world you got to reestablish the Lord's Supper in your congregations. If you're going to call yourself a church that follows the Lord's commandments, you got to do the Lord's commandments. Now, obviously, if every church did that, we'd have no more denominations because they'd follow every commandment. That's right. But I find it so incredible that the primary function of a denominational church is that we are wanting to do what God says, but hey, we're going to take up collection every week, but we won't do the communion. Yeah. You know, in fact, when, when you're looking at the order of how you identify a church of the Bible, partaking of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week is one of the identifying marks. Yes. So I know that if I walk into a congregation and they're not partaking of the Lord's Supper on that Sunday, mm -hmm. then they are not a church that you read about in the New Testament. So that would immediately, to me, be a red flag. You know, if I'm looking for the truth, then uh, the Lord's Supper is, would be one place for me I would start. And you should never run out of these emblems. There should never be a time where you sit there and go, uh-oh, we're out of grape juice, or uh-oh, we don't have any unleavened bread. That's true. And a church that does that would make me question sometimes, uh, did they just have it fall by the wayside, or do they not really do this that much? Yep. You know, we don't forget, like you said, about the collection. We never forget that it's time to take up the money. We should never forget. Now, I understand the collection is a requirement as well, and we should be doing that, but the Lord's Supper should be the first thing on my mind before I ever think about putting my check into that offering plate. Yeah. Because the giving, I've mentioned this before, maybe not on this program, but I've mentioned it before, that when I write a check, that is my sacrificial offering to the Lord. Because I am taking of what I have, the best of what I have, and I'm giving it to God. You know, I don't have rams and bullocks and all of those types of things to just go take from my flock and sacrifice. I've got money, and that's how God wants me to sacrifice today in that sure. regard. And I sacrifice my time as well, but... I must think of the, the Lord's death, and then I, 
I love the opportunity to be so gracious and then giving back to God because of all He's given to me. Yeah, definitely so. Yeah, those are very good points. So we talk about the focus, we talk about the foundation, but you know, what about the fellowship that's happening during the, I mean, is there something special going on with the body of Christ as we do this? Does the Bible mention anything about that? Uh, last night on TV, I noticed that the Golden Globes were on. I didn't get an invitation to that, and I, I don't think I'll ever get an invitation to that. I'm not part of that society. I'm not part of that community. But you know what? I get the opportunity every week to be a part of the most important thing that will occur that week, and that's worship, first of all. But second of all, it's the Lord's Supper. It's an exclusive thing that only Christians are allowed to partake of because it talks about the disciples came together to break bread. But Acts 2 tells me that in about verses 42 and 47, it talks about that they broke bread only after they became Christians. Mm -hmm. This is a special event that I get an opportunity to fellowship with my Lord because I am a part of His family. I am a part of His body. Yeah. And I only get to do that when I'm a part of His body. Yeah, I love how you mentioned that. They uh, continued in the fellowship and breaking of bread, but only after they had obeyed the gospel. Right. You know, this is a special time for a special group of people. I, I think about 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. It says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Mm -hmm. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. You know, this, this is a special occasion. Mm -hmm. And sad to say, many brethren who are Christians would not consider it special and, in fact, would rather be somewhere else. Right. So that's kind of a shame as well. Right. And it's, it's sad. I, I'll say this. I know our time's coming away from us, but I'll say this. It, it's so sad that hunting takes a priority over the Lord and, and shopping and football and sports, all of those take priority over the Lord. Why don't we love the Lord like we're supposed to? Yeah. And if we look back to the New Testament church when it was established, they loved God. And in fact, I would argue they lived in a time where none of this was normal to them. None of this, worshiping on the first day of the week, doing it the way that they did it, that was all brand new to them. Yeah. But I never find a huge problem with the Lord's church suffering from lack of membership in the New Testament. But now that everything is as it usually is and all the normalness has come in, we seem to have forgotten our love for God. Yeah. Seems like we need to stress more the importance of Absolutely. focusing on the death of Christ and falling in love with Jesus again. Friend, we're so thankful that you are part of this broadcast today. We hope that the importance of the Lord's Supper has been taught to you from the Scriptures and that you and I both will remember that this is a very special time for Christians and that we'll value this time. I want to share with you this poem as we close. We gather to remember and pray and honor the real Memorial Day. Not only on Mother's Day in December, but every week we celebrate and remember. With the fruit of the vine, the table of bread, we think about His body and His blood that was shed. He gave Himself in agony and pain so we can gather and praise His holy name. So when times are hard and days are bleak, we look forward to the Memorial Day every single week. Friend, we hope that you remember, for every difficult Bible subject, there is always a common ground that's found right there in the Bible. May God bless you until next time.